What is up, my YouTube family? Welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, then it's just welcome to my channel. Now, welcome back. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed. Unless, of course, your taste level is lacking. If that's the case, then baby, I really don't know what to tell you to do. I've never had to work through such a struggle, okay? Um, but for everyone else, hi. So those of you who've been wanting a longer video from me for quite some time, baby, this is going to be it. Today we are talking about the Ray family cult and ooh, I just came out of the rabbit hole and I'm about to take y'all back down through it. It's a lot to unpack. Let's get into it, shall we? Now, because this is going to be an extra long video and I also want to show y'all some things from Bella's birthday party. She did have another pool party this year. It was a smaller pool party, like a very intimate one this year as opposed to last year, but I got some footage from that, so I'll tell y'all how that went, and I will utilize like the little, the little chapter um, option now we have on YouTube to make it an easier viewing experience for you. So without further ado, let's just get into this case. It is so much to go over, honey. I might film this in two parts, so if, if mid-video, mid-sentence, I go from having this hair hairstyle to a little side ponytail, baby, just roll with it okay so talia ray enrolls into sarah lawrence college in the fall of 2009 and anybody who comes in contact with talia or has a conversation with her baby they hear about her beloved father she dotes on him non-stop now let talia tell it he is a heroic man he was part of a special unit within the military he was also a part of the cia problem is her father is also a truth teller and these particular groups don't necessarily like that according to talia because her father was not with the bs this group of very powerful men have been working to silence her father these are very vindictive men and because of them he has been sent to prison and painted out to be some sort of monster when truthfully according to her he was attempting to save her and her sister from their very abusive mother when he kidnapped them and she would often tell her peers stories of like her mom being this maniac basically and the stories would sound a bit odd like one is that they had poison in the walls when they were young because their mother tried to poison them it was just a little bit strange her story basically in a nutshell was that her mother was crazy and harmful and her father is this super great man and she is proud of him so proud of him actually that she's in school to become a lawyer to help people like him now, Talia adjusts to college life pretty well. She has no problems making friends and settling in. Sophomore year, she and a group of friends decide to roam together in this apartment building that was structured for student living. The building is structured in a way that would allow for all non-students to have their own rooms and then they would share spaces like the kitchen, bathroom, etc. The place was an ideal space for the friend group and they are super excited. Not only is it very affordable, they can afford the rent, but they have just enough distance from school where it's not too far, but it's just far enough for them to have a good amount of privacy. Now, a little bit into sophomore year, Talia announces to her roommates and friends that finally they would get the opportunity to meet her father and experience for themselves how magical of a man he is. Talia is extremely excited to be reunited with her father and she asks her friend group not to judge him because he really does not have anything. Everything was taken from him and he is essentially getting out of prison to start life over. And with him being in this predicament, he also needs a little help, a little bit of assistance getting on his feet. So for the time being, he'll need to crash there for a little while. That is, if it is okay with everyone. And the group is compassionate. They agree to allow him to come and stay there for a little bit. Now, when Larry is released from jail, he settles into his daughter's room and she wastes no time introducing him to everyone to go ahead and break the ice. You know, he's a strange 50-year-old man in a house full of college students. Larry is extremely social with them. He's very warm. He makes them feel very comfortable. And for the first couple of days, he has a lot of conversations with them about his life prior to being incarcerated, telling them stories about the military and his time working with the CIA. He's showing them a bunch of pictures with him and other men in power like Bernard Carrick and Rudy Giuliani. Many of his stories sound a little bit outlandish. Then he'll pull out a picture of him and these guys and you'd be like, well, maybe there is some truth to some of these 
stories about you and old Rudy. Over the following weeks, Larry essentially becomes dad of the house. He is always there, but oddly never in the way. Unless, of course, the guys want to pile on the couch and watch sports or play video games and he's there taking a nap. But the pros of him being there far outweigh the cons as far as the students are concerned because he cleans all the time. He keeps all of the shared spaces clean. So they really don't have to worry about that. That was nice. He cooks a lot. He makes them home-cooked meals often, which is also a big plus for a bunch of college students. Larry here is blending into the apartment building quite well, and Talia could not be happier. Now, one evening after Larry's been there for quite some time now, he calls a house meeting and in it informs the group that society is changing and basically you either go with the flow and end up wherever or you actively decide which direction you want your life to go in and how you exist in order to do that though you need to tap into your higher self right you need to connect with your higher consciousness and he presents them this powerpoint presentation called q4p breaking it all down and he expresses to them that he has the ability to provide them a level of clarity that they'll need to connect to their higher self and he can just give them this clarity he can guide them to the clarity or they can just go through the trials and tribulations of life like everybody else and fumble and fall and do it the hard way, basically. He lets them know that he will not force them, but if they want this clarity, the easy way is more than willing to lend his wisdom and help them gain it. Now, Isabella is the first student that Larry begins working to help, and Isabella is Talia's best friend. She had come to Sarah Lawrence on a full academic scholarship from an all-girls Catholic school in San Antonio, Texas. Now, Isabella's issues were that before coming to college, she basically had it all envisioned, like how it would be, how it would be this great time. She'd be away from home. She'd have some freedom and it would be fun. But college so far wasn't that. And that had caused her to become a little bit withdrawn, a little bit depressed. Not to mention she is also currently going through a breakup. So she's in a very dark place and she has been for a while. For their first session of working through her issues, Larry spends a consecutive 16 hours with Isabella inside of her room. And during that time, the other students are advised not to interrupt. Don't knock on the door, baby. Don't slide no papers under the door. This is very important work and find you something else to do, basically. And because none of them knows what the process looks like, they don't really question it. They just figure that, you know, he knows what he's doing, maybe, maybe not. And over the following couple of weeks, he spends a lot of time focusing on Isabella and her healing, something that he apparently needs to sleep in her room in order to do. Now, at this point, when he starts sleeping in her room, one of the guys in the house kind of confronts him about it being a little weird. And he himself, Larry, he acts like he's a little bit offended. He's like, it's not like I'm sleeping in bed with this girl. I'm sleeping on the floor. Like, don't make it weird. At that point, the guy just eases up. Isabella isn't complaining. Let me just mind my business. And so it continues. But the week before Christmas break is when things get a little more weird because Isabella calls home to her mother and tells her mother that she will not be coming home. Now, when her mom asks her, you know, why won't you be coming home? She tells her that she has someone else who will explain it to her and she passes the phone to Larry. He tells her, I don't know if you knew this, but your daughter was essayed by a family friend. She's in a lot of emotional turmoil right now. She's been in a very dark place place for a while now and if she comes home over the break then she will off herself like we've already talked about it I don't want it to happen so she's not coming home he then proceeds to tell the woman that he doesn't know what kind of mother she is right now but obviously she was a very bad one back in the day one that didn't protect her one that had allowed this to happen to her and he's gonna help Isabella get better because he really does care about her now, Isabella's mother is taken aback because, first of all, she's never heard any anything about this happening to Isabella as a child. The two of them have always been really close, and she's never said anything about this. Hearing this for the first time is a lot, but she loves her daughter very much, and she's basically like, look, I don't want that to happen either, so if staying at school over 
winter break is what she needs then by all means please stay larry tries to reassure her mom and tell her that he can help her with anything that he knows techniques and tricks to discipline the mind from training that he had received from the government and in the weeks after the other eight students inside of the little apartment building they all witness isabella change Unlike before, Larry, she's vibrant, she's happy, and very social. To them, this signifies that Larry must know what he's talking about. Like, it's obviously working. So next, Talia's boyfriend, Santos, goes to Larry, and he needs help unpacking his childhood trauma. He had attempted therapy before to work through these things, but hadn't achieved the desired results, and Larry makes him feel seen. During the initial conversation with Larry, he feels like Larry understands him and gets him in ways that not only his therapist was not able to, but his parents had not been able to either. Larry tells him that he can build up his confidence and his self-esteem, which is what he needs as a man, and tells him to, you know, start with sitting up straight. That's the first thing. So he has Santos walking around with his chest out, honey, feeling a little bit taller, and then Claudia decides... Maybe I'll give it a go. Her first conversation with Larry one-on-one -on -one lasts for hours, the same way Isabella's had. And one thing about Claudia that the group had noticed before is that she's the type that thinks it's kind of cool to stand out. It didn't have to be something that was seen as cool or good. It just had to be something that made her different. She liked to be different. After she had started having her long conversations with Larry, one night the students are together and they're having a little session where they're smoking the devil's lettuce honey, as they usually normally typically do. And when Claudia's offered a little bit, unlike every other time, she declines and offers an explanation. I have schizophrenia and it's not good to smoke that when you have it. This is the very first time that anybody is hearing that she had schizophrenia and everyone is confused. And it's not that she's been keeping this diagnosis a secret or anything like that. She explains to them that no, she's never received any type of diagnosis from an actual medical professional. It's Larry. Larry has deduced from their lengthy conversations that she is indeed schizophrenic and she is now convinced that she is. Now, Raven, one of the girls in the house, tells her, you can't just go around claiming schizophrenia, girl. It just does not work like that. And Claudia says that telling her that she is not schizophrenic is actually harmful to her healing process. And Raven is like, girl, what? Now, in addition to her newfound um, diagnosis, Claudia also begins telling the group a lot of childhood stories, very traumatic stories that she had never told before. And that did not sound on brand for how she typically spoke of her childhood. So it was very strange to all of her other friends. She then begins confronting her family with all of these imaginary issues. And they are not only confused because these things never happened. They are also not happy to hear that this older man is living there with their daughter and eight other students. Claudia's parents go to the Dean of Student Life to complain but are told that although they have received other complaints about Larry there's really nothing that they could do about it because a father has the right to see his daughter if he was just some random guy there or like a boyfriend they'd be more inclined to act on it but he is a father of one of the students and they basically don't see anything wrong with him being there now, collectively, the students are beginning to whisper about how weird things are becoming. But one by one, Larry is getting them alone to have these long conversations. And it's like all of a sudden they're in the sunken place or at least in a space where they're feeling like, hmm, maybe he's on to something like maybe he's right. At the end of their sophomore year, Larry moves out of the unit and moves into an apartment. A nice little high rise in the sky, honey. He invites the kids over to see it and they love it. It is so nice and they are all very impressed. And you probably wonder how does he afford it? Maybe he doesn't, okay? The apartment is not his apartment at all. It is actually an apartment of a friend of his named Lee Chen. He had been telling Lee that his former best friend, Bernard Carrick, the former NYC police commissioner, had betrayed him by helping take his children from him when in reality he had actually lost custody of them. 
had turned around after that and kidnapped them from the mother was subsequently arrested and then sent to prison. He tells Lee a very woe is me version of that story and how he had lost everything that the CIA had now turned on him and was just making his life a living hell, right? He just needed a little bit of help getting on his feet. Lee had offered him to stay at his nice apartment to help him out, not knowing that he would show up with a bunch of college kids and offer them the opportunity to live there for the summertime instead of going home, which he does. When offered the opportunity to stay at this nice apartment over the summer as opposed to going home, the students jump at the opportunity. It is not all of them. It's Santos, Claudia, and Isabella, the students that he has begun his work on already. And of course, his number one fan is Talia, his daughter. Larry, of course, takes the master bedroom, which he offers Isabella to join and share with him. And the rest of them, they just crash in sleeping bags in the living room. Now, Lee thinks this is a bit odd. He does not really see the point or purpose of having a bunch of college students around. Now, when he asks Larry, what's the purpose of having all these kids around? Like, for what? Larry tells him, you know, there's only so much work that I can do on my own. I am building an army. Now, Dan is among some of the other students who really were skeptical of Larry. But Larry is so slick that when he sinks his little claws into Dan, Dan does not even realize that it's happening. Dan is in a relationship with Raven and feels that he is not being the best partner he can to her. And he is afraid of losing his partner because of his own inadequacies. So he goes to Santos for relationship advice, who then tells him, Larry actually probably could give you some better advice. He gives me great advice. He's older. He's a man. You know, he's been out here dealing with the women for quite some time now. So he could, well, some of the time was in jail, but you know what I mean? Like he could, he could tell you how to deal with the ladies, Okay. And Dan feels like, you know, that's not a bad idea or suggestion. Why not ask Community Dad for advice, you know? Dan calls Larry and tells him that he would like to, you know, have a chat, get some advice about his relationship. And Dan offers to help him out and suggest that they meet at a Starbucks, which they do. And they sit and talk for hours. During the conversation, Larry is serving up the wisdom and inspirational quotes off of Google Images, just really laying it on thick like he is Master Sensei. He tells Dan that he is exceptionally intelligent and he could build more complex mazes inside of his mind than the average person, than most people, in fact, and that could bring about a lot of confusion, especially when you don't know what to do with all of that. You don't know how to channel it, right? And I don't know that I've ever built a maze inside my head, but follow me. This is how he got Dan. Over the course of the conversation, he makes Dan go from, hmm, he's, he's kind of making sense to, okay, he is very insightful, actually, very smart. And by the end of the conversation, he feels like, wow, Larry is really the man. He would make a great mentor. Like, maybe I need Larry to do this thing called life. Because so far, I've just been lost and winging it. And it's not feeling like that's working for me. Larry got the cheat codes, apparently. So then Dan brings up the topic of his sexuality, something that he is not quite sure of. He doesn't know whether he's gay or not. So Larry asks if he's attracted to men. He says he doesn't know for sure. And Larry tells Dan, well, I know for sure you're not gay. So stop entertaining the thought. At this point, Dan feels like Larry has all of this wisdom and he's like, well, maybe he's right. So he accepts that as his truth and decides to no longer put that pressure on himself to answer that question, whether he likes men or women. He's just like, you know what? I like the girls. I'm straight. And afterward feels like a weight has been lifted off of his shoulders. He said that he had felt lost and directionless. And suddenly this man, this real man comes into his life and gives him this incredible sense of validation, it makes him feel seen and heard and is offering to give him the guidance to be a big man too. At the end of his advice, Larry tells Dan that he needs to break up with his girlfriend, dump Raven, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done to build you up and make you the man that you can be. So get rid of her and let's do the work. Dan tells Larry that he is going to break things off with his girlfriend and he will revert back and let him know how it goes. And then, you know, they could begin to 
start their relationship as mentor mentee. When they walk out of the Starbucks, Larry invites Dan over to this idling limo. They have been sitting there for hours while they talk. Inside are Santos, Claudia, Isabella, and Talia all there in the limo. They had just been sitting there waiting. And Dan thinks it's really strange. Like, why have y'all just been sitting in this idling limo all of these hours we've been inside talking? It's weird. Despite how odd it feels, he gets inside of the limo and goes back to Larry's apartment with the group. At this point, the invitation to move in as well is also extended to Dan, which he accepts. He thinks it's a cool idea. Everybody seems like, you know, they enjoy being there and he had not had his housing situated for the following semester. So why not, right? Dan then does as he is advised to do and breaks up with his girlfriend, Raven. Raven tells him just like she told Claudia. Larry is insane. There is no reason to listen to him. He does not know what he's talking about. He's cool, cool for Cocoa Puffs, baby. And you are too if you're going to do what he says. Like, be for real, he has Claudia running around here, convinced that she has a whole mental disorder. But Dan tells her that Larry is investing in him, that Larry really does care about him and is helping him to become his best self. And that if she doesn't support Larry and his workings, then she does not support him and his wellness. She is completely floored that her boyfriend, Dan, is taking this position and she just basically tells him, like, I do care about you. I do support you, which is why I'm being honest with you. And I cannot just go along with Larry's shenanigans. And this is their last conversation because Dan is really committed to the process. Raven, at this point, she is really making a fuss about Larry. She has complained to the school about him. She has attempted to talk to her friends out from underneath his spell, but nothing is working. Santos, Claudia, Isabella, Talia, and now Dan all seem to have this strange devotion to Larry all of a sudden. And not many people seem to care about the effects that he is having on these kids. Speaking of the kids, this group, they are expecting the summer to be lit. Like, whole sleepover vibe, just fun stuff all the time. But Larry has a very different idea of what their days will look like. He has a specific playlist that is to be played at the top of every morning to get them pumped and ready for their day. And he controls every aspect of their day, what they do, what they eat, what time they eat, what time they do anything. They are to do push-ups before they are to do anything else. And each week, the number of push-ups increases. It gets to the point where they are doing 400 push-ups. After the push-ups, they are to complete any kind of chores or tasks that have been assigned to them by Larry. And there is some fun. Like they have family meals together. They have movie nights, game nights. Some nights they have very deep and intense discussions that go on literally for the entire night. He gives them expensive clothing. He gives them shoes. And occasionally, we will treat the group to these very upscale steakhouses for dinner, which he always paid for with this huge wad of cash. And Larry also has a limo driver that is on call for him 24 hours a day. He calls all the time to transport them to places. None of the kids know exactly what Larry does to generate revenue. He just tells them that he has multiple streams of income and it's apparent that money is coming in from somewhere. Larry requires that all of the students identify with either masculine or feminine energy and that they need to really hone in on it. If it's masculinity then do manly stuff okay and if you're feeling feminine if it's the feminine energy that you have then you need to do feminine things like always have your hair done always wear makeup and just be Dan, who is a more feminine man, and this is the one that has questioned his sexuality, he is encouraged to wear like bright pink colors because that is what men do who are secure in their masculinity, per Larry, and it just gives like, I'm a man, and I'm sure I'm a man. Now, once Dan enters the fold, Larry becomes very interested in his sex life. He begins asking Dan about Isabella. What does he think about her? Does he find her attractive? Is she pretty? And Dan is like, sure, 
Now, truthfully, although he does recognize that she is an attractive woman, he is not attracted to her. But with encouragement, he goes and flirts with her. Larry then begins having these one-on-one -on -one sex education courses with Dan to try to teach him how to please a woman. And these sessions were kind of interesting because he tells him like the best music to listen to is like old age classical music from the 1800s and I don't know what y'all ladies into but baby I just don't know if that'll do it for me I don't think so at all actually he tells Dan to tease the ladies build up the excitement run your fingers lightly across her back like this then he would rub his little hairy fingers along Dan's back, all nice and slow and go, now you try it. And he would demonstrate and instruct Dan to perform several different methods of like intimate touches like this, and then encourages Dan to try some of these touches on Isabella. But Dan is not comfortable doing anything beyond flirting with Isabella. Truthfully, he don't even really want to be doing that, okay? And it's no shade. Isabella is a beautiful girl. One night, Dan is sitting in the living room, minding his business like he always do. And Isabella comes out of the bedroom and she just begins kissing him. The two of them make out and then Dan just forgets about it. He thinks that maybe, maybe Isabella has a little crush on him. She was acting that out. Maybe they just had a moment, right? But then a couple of weeks later, Larry leads the two of them. Isabella and Dan to the bedroom and instructs them to have sex with one another while he watches. The two students do as they are instructed and Dan uses all of the tips and tricks that Larry has taught him. Sure that Larry will be watching and judging that his teachings and his time are not being wasted and afterward he feels like wow Larry must really know what he's talking about because I did that. Isabella seemed to be quite pleased by all of the things that he was doing and these sessions become a regular occurrence and eventually sometimes Larry would participate with them as well and allegedly because I don't want them coming for my Apple Watch baby I can't even find the charger okay allegedly Lee Chen who is the owner of this apartment is also invited to join in without asking Dan or Isabella's consent. Larry claims that this is all a part of Dan and Isabella's journeys to clarity. Now Dan finds it to be very weird and uncomfortable but Isabella does not have the same reaction as him so he starts to feel like is it me? Like am I the problem if everybody else is just having a good time? Maybe he's thinking small when he needs to be thinking big. You know, he's he's really thinking that it's him. The fall semester of their junior year begins in 2011 and the students are spending most, if not all, of their time inside of Larry's apartment when they're not in class. This semester, Dan and Claudia are studying abroad in England and Larry informs them that although y'all are across the pond, baby, y'all are still expected to participate in family meetings. Even all those miles apart, Dan is still not able to escape these awkward sex sessions with Dan because the video Skype sessions, the family meetings that they have, are Dan instructing them to engage in a little adult exchange with one another while he watches on the screen and makes like demands and gives instruction. Now, when their time abroad is over, Dan returns to the house or the apartment, but Claudia does not. She gets on campus housing and she still visits Larry's apartment frequently and still is very close to Larry. One late night on a weekend, Claudia and Larry actually show up to her parents' house unannounced and unexpected. Her parents are surprised about the visit, but they are happy to see their daughter nonetheless. They'll take Larry too, I guess, because he's here. They welcome the two of them in, but they could not have predicted how this visit would have gone and what it was actually about. Larry begins asking her parents about their first child, a daughter that they had lost at birth. And then he tells them that it must have been hard to love Claudia, having just gone through such a loss. And Claudia's mother is like, what? Like, no, it was never hard for me to love my daughter. Larry challenges this and is basically like you couldn't have 
you couldn't have loved her. It would have been impossible to just love Claudia so much after such a tough loss. And this back and forth between them brings Claudia's mother to tears because this is a lot. Girl, first of all, who, why are y'all here this late? And this is what you come with? Like, this is a lot. Y'all got me out of bed for this? To upset me, girl? And to make matters worse, Claudia tells her mother, I don't believe you could have loved me, mom. I don't believe you could have loved me because of her. And of course, her dad is pissed at this point because how you gonna come in here with my child and make my woman cry? And it's just a whole lot going on. And when Larry leaves, Claudia leaves with him. At this point, it becomes abundantly clear to her parents that as far as this Larry guy goes, something is very wrong here. And indeed it is. Now, Santos had spoken really highly of his sisters to Larry. And lately, he's been noticing that his younger sister, Yalitza, is displaying a lot of symptoms of depression. He feels like Dan has been a tremendous help to himself, to Isabella, to Claudia. Talia thinks he's a hit. Now Dan as well. Why not connect him with Yalitza and see if he can help her too? He seems pretty, pretty willing to help the young. At the time that he introduces her to Larry, she is an undergrad at Columbia. And as her brother has suspected, she is suffering and battling depression as of lately. When Yalitza comes into the fold and visits the apartment, she is in awe of the dynamic. She feels like this is a family. This is what a community feels like. Everybody is so supportive of one another. Yalitza leaps at the opportunity to join them inside of the apartment and began working through our issues with Larry. The spring semester of junior year begins, and at this point, Larry is ready to move everyone into the next phase of this experience of unlocking their higher self. And the first lesson is accountability. Larry, who for over a year now has made each of them feel like he has their absolute best interest in mind. He has never given them a reason to really question that. They are of the belief that he has the absolute best intentions for them. Now, he advises them that for this next phase, he would need their nerves to be as raw as possible. And to achieve such a state, they would need to go without sleep as long as they can and scale back on the eating. Okay? He supplies them with these pills that will help them stay up. And while they're up, he's like, you know what? We're not just going to be up looking at each other. We're going to reorganize this entire place because there's a bunch of them living in this one bedroom apartment and stuff is everywhere. Afterward, they would have a late night dinner and then everyone gathers in the living room for a confession session. During these sessions, the group gets to interrogate one person about either one particular thing or literally any and everything. And usually the person that lands themselves in the hot seat has done something to Larry that he does not like whether intentionally or unintentionally. It would be really trivial things like scratching or scraping the bottom of a cooking pan or being wasteful or breaking something. These are all considered intentional manifestations of their childhood trauma. Someone could accidentally drop a glass and break it and he would say, nope, that's an intentional manifestation of you being abused as a child. You did that to hurt me because you're hurt because hurt people hurt people like it don't make sense but you follow it me right bella is laid on her back in my lap right now and i'm trying to give y'all the, the details of this the purpose of these confession sessions larry explains is to reveal deep personal truth but a lot of times there aren't any deep personal truths to reveal. However, the session goes on until something is revealed. And after a long day of working and performing various tasks, only having a little bit to eat and sitting here for hours of being questioned, they become so exhausted and sleep deprived that they would make up things to confess just to end the session. And these confessions, they have to be something that Larry finds satisfactory like it can't be something small like oh I broke a cup no it had to be something very dramatic or Larry would be like nah that's not it dig deeper darker 
One evening after spending hours in the hot seat with literally no end in sight, Dan tells the story that finally meets Larry Sanders. He says that when he was a kid, he found an injured baby bird. He held it in his arms, in his hands, and crushed it. And he goes on to say that this was a very traumatic thing that has helped form him as an adult. The story is entirely made up. But it ends the session, and Larry finds that that's, that's dark enough. And now, when Larry's daughter, Talia, misses the deadline for Stanford Law, Larry becomes furious with Dan, accusing him of being at fault for her missing the deadline because he was a distraction to her. He accuses Dan of intentionally sabotaging Talia with his, his presence. For this infraction, Larry hosts yet another confession session where Dan is again in the hot seat. But because Dan has maintained that he was not in fault, Larry kicks it up a notch. He takes a wrench and threatens to pull out each one of Dan's teeth every time he denies his responsibility. Dan remains adamant that he had nothing to do with Talia not making this deadline. Larry takes the wrench grabs Dan's tongue and pulls it, demanding that he confess as one of the other members records the whole thing. There is a documentary about it on Hulu and there's also like YouTube clips of this confession session here on YouTube. If I remember, I'll link it below, but if not, charge it to my head and not my heart, I forgot. Still, Dan is refusing to say what Larry wants him to say and then the camera stops, but Larry does not. Unsatisfied with Dan's versions of events, Larry takes aluminum foil and begins forming these small like balls. He then rolls them up in a string of saran wrap, forming like a necklace with like a bunch of aluminum chunks in it. And in front of the entire group, he demands that Dan take off his clothes and wrap this contraption around his genitals. And then Larry takes the rope that he's made and twists them as hard as he can. The metal cuts off his circulation and into his flesh. Next, he zeroes in on Santos and asks him why he had broken so much of his stuff. Why are you damaging so many of my things? And Santos does not recall breaking anything or damaging anything. However, Larry then makes the issue that Santos has a problem with accountability and owning up to things. And then at this point, Santos begins to question, do I have an accountability problem? Do I not remember? Like, am I tripping? Is this part of the trauma that is embedded within me? He extends an apology to Larry, believing that maybe he had done something and just didn't remember. Now, the next issue that Larry has is again with Santos, and he won't even tell him what the infraction is. He just accuses Santos of hurting him and doing it intentionally. And Santos is like, baby, what did I do? I don't even know what I did. I, I don't know where to start. Larry is becoming very angry and is demanding an apology right away. But Santos doesn't even know what he's supposed to be admitting to. So it's just a lot of chaos and confusion and toxicity. Larry begins to berate him in front of the group. He is completely tearing Santos down and no one in the group says anything. They are just staring at him, completely fixated on what is going on. Santos becomes very emotional. He begins to cry and beg Larry to help him understand what he had done. And Larry is just like, confess, confess, confess. And it's just like, girl, to what exactly? So finally, he just says that he damaged some of Larry's belongings because, child, why not just ride the last infraction, okay? Not, why, why not just piggyback off of that? So he says that he damaged some things that belong to Larry and he's apologizing for it. And Larry asks him for a list of everything that he has damaged. So he goes to sit and write the list. But each time he returns it to Larry, Larry is like, that's not all of it. There's more. You've done more. So Santos goes back and adds to the list and they just keep doing this back and forth until Santos has literally listed everything in the apartment that he could think of down to the damn baseboards, okay? Any and everything that he's come into contact with or could have potentially come into contact with is on the list. 
It is five full pages of items. Each item has a value listed next to it. And the total value of all these things that Santos allegedly damaged is over $47,000. What is being eaten behind me? So now Santos has this huge debt because Larry wants to be paid back for his, his damages. Therefore, Santos needs to figure out how he is going to redeem himself. The very last thing that Santos wants is to be exiled from this group, this community that he has been a part of all this time and has enjoyed up until recently. So he immediately begins thinking of ways that he can satisfy this outstanding debt. And of course, Larry puts the pressure on him to figure it out. Quickly. So Santos makes the decision to contact his parents and ask them for some of the money. They did have a small business, but they were not well off. They just had enough to live comfortably and put their kids through college. They explained to him that they don't have 47000 to just give to him, just laying around. And then he threatens to take his life if they do not. Fearing that they may actually lose their son, they now are trying to figure out ways to get as much of the 47 k as they can. His mother goes and pawns all of her jewelry and a few other items of value, and they send the money from that over to their son. It's not nearly the entire amount, but it's something. Santos is grateful for it and eager to go and give it to Larry. Unfortunately for him, though, his gesture falls short of Larry's satisfaction. Larry listens to everything that his parents had to do to get it. Santos makes him a promise to still pay him the rest. And then he is like, you, you don't really want to satisfy this debt. You don't really want to pay me back because you only asked your parents, just them and no one else. You cannot possibly care about paying me the full amount back. It can't possibly be important to you. And from there, Santos goes and contacts literally everyone he knows, casually asking for a couple thousand dollars. And among these people that he reaches out to is, of course, the students that were a part of the original group of nine. And they find this to be extremely odd. Of course, over time, as things have progressed and they have become these devoted followers of Larry, the other students have separated from them. Larry's little group actually kicked off the separation. They would see them on campus and go a separate way. They essentially felt the same way that Dan expressed feeling to Raven. Like, if you don't support Larry and our work, then you don't support me and my wellness. With that idea, they have begun, like, seeing the other kids and going the opposite way on campus, crossing the streets to avoid them. Like they really work to separate themselves and draw that line in the sand. But now Santos need a little bit of this cash. He need 47K, or roughly about 43K. And he is contacting them again, asking for their help. He does not tell them that he needs this money for Larry. He just tells them that, you know, he has this outstanding debt. He needs money, donations, all of that. But they know that it's very likely that Larry has put him up to this. So they are concerned about their friend's mental state and they attempt to talk some sense into him, but it doesn't work. He does not want to hear anything but a cash app alert, okay? Then something else very strange happens. The students receive an email that is addressed to the dean, but CCs all of the students in student housing. The email is from Claudia, and it is a long, strange, rambling email confessing to doing the most bizarre things, poisoning people, lying about all of these crazy things. Some of the lies that she confessed to telling people were not even things that they recall her saying to them. It was just completely weird. She also goes on and on about how great of a guy Larry is, how she had told someone before that he had violated her personal boundaries and how that was a lie. He's never done anything like that. She basically confesses to being a horrible person and apologizes for it. Some members of the old friend group reach out to her. They want to make sure she's okay and she does not respond. But months later, she does reach out to one of them very casually like, hey, what's up? And they're like, girl, I wanted to check on you months ago when the email came out. 
a bizarre email and she's like, oh no, everything is fine. Everything is great. There's literally no reason to worry about me. I'm perfect. They ask how things are going with Larry. She says, Larry is perfect. Larry is great. He is literally the only reason that I'm still alive. This man is magnificent. Larry had explained to the group that people outside don't have like the mental capacity to understand his work and what is going on with the group. They just, they just don't have the ability to see the bigger picture. So it's really no use in arguing with them or debating. Just let them be in the dark and ignorant. They are special and they can see things that not everyone can. And it's just that simple. Senior year begins. And the once extremely close friend group could not be more like strangers. They are completely divided. The ones that live with Larry won't even make eye contact with the others. Okay. Talia and Santos break up and she moves out of the apartment and back into campus housing. So now there is Dan, Santos, Yalitza, Claudia, Isabella, and of course, Larry. They are the Ray family. Claudia still doesn't live in the apartment either, but she's still very much involved in spending all of her time. She might as well live there. She's always there. Now Larry begins having each of the students film these confession videos where they confessed to doing all of these weird and terrible things. Then they would beg for forgiveness and promise to do better. And although this is something that is unusual, Larry has done nothing but support them and push them to be the best versions of themselves, according to them. And so this is another situation where it's like, yeah, things are getting a little weird, but I just have to trust the process. He's always told them this wouldn't be comfortable every step of the way. As time goes on, the things that he's accusing them of become more bizarre. One day he comes home and he accuses them all of working with Bernard Carrick, plotting against him this entire time that they have been at his apartment. All but Isabella, who has proven her devotion to him and would never do such a thing. Isabella is kind of like a teacher's pet, so to speak. She is exempt from a lot of these things that go on. He really takes it easy on her compared to the other members of the group. The two of them definitely blur the lines between mentor and mentor and boyfriend and girlfriend. It's quite obvious that they have been, you know, having something going on for a very long time now. And her feelings, she makes them very obvious to him. She dotes on him. She flirts with him. She confesses her love to him, but he never publicly returns any of her affections. She seems to be okay with that. Now, Santos and Yalitza, they have one more sibling, an older sister named Felicia, who misses her siblings and decides to come to town and pay them a visit. Felicia is a Harvard graduate and has a medical degree from Columbia. She has also just started her residency in LA. She has dinner with her siblings and Larry, and she is not at all bothered by him joining her siblings for his presence at all. She is actually quite the opposite. According to her, it was love at first sight for both of them when they locked eyes. They had such a great time enjoying each other's company at dinner that she joins them back at Larry's apartment after dinner and her and Larry sit and have a very in-depth conversation that goes on for hours. Felicia is in school to become a psychiatrist and this is something that Larry finds to be fascinating. When she returns from her trip visiting her siblings, she and Larry continue to talk every day and their bond quickly blossoms into a long distance relationship. They spend day and night on the phone together and they're talking so much that it is impeding on Felicia's residency. And then Larry begins to gaslight her about prioritizing her work calls over his call. He's telling her that she can't possibly care about him if anything else comes before him. Sometimes he is like questioning. He's not really questioning, but he questions to her whether or not it's really a work call. He just is very toxic. And her trying to accommodate him ultimately results in her losing her residency. And then she is subsequently evicted from her apartment because mama ain't bringing in no money. So mama can't pay the bills. 
A few weeks later, Larry frantically calls Yulitsa and Santos into the bedroom and he is telling them like, we have to get Felicia out of LA. Like, it's not safe for her to be there. People are after her. They're trying to get at me through her. It's just not safe. Puts her on speaker. She is sobbing. She is frantic. She's telling him that she's terrified, that she's so afraid. She wants to leave LA ASAP. And the siblings are confused as to what's going on. But of course, they're concerned because this is their sister. And she tells them that these people have come out of nowhere and how they have been terrorizing her since they found out that she was involved with Larry and she doesn't feel safe. Now, who these people are and what they've done to Felicia to have her so shaken up and afraid, they don't know. But before they know it, Felicia is there with them in New York. Now, when she arrives, she's sobbing. She's still very hysterical, very shaken up. And she tells them basically that these people came out of nowhere. They told her that, hey, do what we tell you to do or we're going to hurt you and your family. And when her siblings ask her who, like, who are these people? She says that they're people that her parents have known for a very long time because Bernard Carrick had introduced her parents to them long ago. And this doesn't make any sense. First of all, girl, your parents are these modest little immigrants. And what ties would they have to the NYC police commissioner? Like, let's be real. They don't. They could, but in this particular situation and story that I'm telling you, I'm telling you her parents don't, okay? But she is convinced that they do. This does sound a bit strange to them, and they also notice that their sister is very different from how they remember her. She seems so different personality-wise. The shell of her former self is how Santos describes her. She's not bright. She's not being funny and charismatic like she normally is. They also recognize that her story does sound a bit far-fetched. They never, never heard their parents talk about Bernard Carrick, never knew him to have any affiliation with their parents. It was just very bizarre. And Larry also questions the validity of her story right there in front of them. He's like, are you making this up? Tell me. And she's like, no, I'm not making it up. I promise. The video clips of this, because Larry also filmed it, are available online as well and child she seems really really terrified and very shaken up like genuinely disturbed needless to say she does not return to california she settles into the apartment she is under the impression that she is moving in with her man okay she's gonna share the master suite with him and she will but um not in the way that she had envisioned now, Larry had already told her that he does not allow sleeping with clothes on. So when she removes her clothing and shows up to the bedroom to, to get in the bed with her man, he is laying in the center of the bed on his back, balls to the ceiling, and Isabella is there laying on his right, like facing him, cuddled up to him, with one leg over his leg and her hand over his pee-pee, like she's like... Gosh, like she's guarding it, staking claim. Like you can touch anything in this room, but this. So naturally, Felicia's like, what the hell is going on here? And Larry is wanting to know what her problem is. Like, are you not educated and progressive? Don't be like that. She takes her place on the right side of Larry and joins them in the bed. And this is the dynamic that continues. They basically become sister wives at this point. Felicia has seen just the tip of the iceberg as far as red flags. Larry shreds her paperwork from her residency as well as her copy of her degree. And he says he does this as a way to protect her and hide her away. Several weeks into the Rosario siblings all being together there with Larry in his apartment, they begin confronting their parents about their memories of abuse that had occurred in their childhood, including S.A. These are memories that have been unlocked by Larry in his sessions. Their parents insist that none of these things have ever happened, like literally none of this has ever taken place, and we don't know where it came from. And instead of them cutting their parents off and not having anything to do with them since they are these monsters, they tell them that they can redeem themselves for being such terrible parents by giving them money now. And they specifically go in on the mom telling her, like, you didn't protect us from dad. He did all these horrible things to us. But you can make it right. 
the cash app. On three separate occasions, their parents go to the NYPD with their complaints about Larry, telling them that he is using their children to try and extort them and that he's gotten in their head and has them saying all these crazy things. But each time they are told that because their children are adults and they are not being held hostage, that they're willing participants in all of these things, that there's nothing that can be done. And sadly, the parents fear that not complying with their children's requests would result in them losing their children forever. They continue to fork over funds to the tune of $200,000 over a three-year span. They sold their home, cars, and other valuables to give money to their children, knowing that it was going to Larry. One night, the Rosarios receive a phone call from a doctor at Mount Sinai Hospital. Elixa, their youngest daughter, had been admitted after she had swallowed an entire bottle of Tylenol in an attempt to end her life and is now in a coma. They immediately rush to visit her and Thankfully, she does come out of the coma eventually. She is then transferred to another hospital where her parents continue to visit her for several days until they show up one day and are stopped by security and told that they cannot enter their daughter's room. They are advised that if they want to speak with the doctor or if they want to see Elitza, they would have to do so in the presence of Larry per their daughter's request. Larry had also paid her a visit and he had managed to get inside of her head telling her that while she was in a coma, he was the one that gave suggestions to her medical staff that ultimately saved her life. That he had looked over her lab results and saw things that they did not catch. And he had convinced her that he had saved her like she basically owed him and had advised her not to speak with her parents that they could not be trusted and obviously did not care about her, did not protect her or have her best interest at heart like he does. And strangely, one year later, Claudia would do the exact same thing. She would take the full bottle, land herself in a hospital where her parents would visit daily until one day they are no longer allowed to. And Larry begins to pick on Dan again. And at this point, Dan is rethinking his position within the Ray family. He is feeling like it's beginning to be a little bit too hard to be a part of the crew. But at this point, he has completely been isolated and ostracized from all of his friends, from his family as well. Like he completely cut his family off. He was lost before Larry. He kind of still feels lost now, but at least he has someone there with a guided light, like attempting to show him the way. And toward the end of the fall semester, yet again, Dan's sexuality has become a topic and a focal point for Larry. When Larry brings up his sexuality, he admits to still feeling unsure about it. And Larry becomes upset. He says, enough of this. He instructs Isabella to go to her closet and get one of her dresses and then calls for all of the other students to gather around in the living room. He makes Dan put this dress on and go down to the lobby of the apartment building to get the mail. When Dan returns, Larry hands him a sex toy and orders him to penetrate himself in front of the group. Dan follows Larry's orders and is humiliated. Larry had always told him that everything that happened in that apartment was for their own good. But after this experience, it becomes very clear to Dan that that is not the case. Afterward, Dan is just so broken, he feels completely hopeless. He goes up to the top of the apartment building and he stands at the edge looking over and contemplates jumping. All he wanted was to be the best version of himself, but all of this was just too much. But something about him finally coming to the realization that Larry is not no damn sensei, he is a master manipulator and a monster. This realization feels mentally freeing for Dan. Like why not attempt to pick up the pieces and start over, even if he has to do so alone. Like it's worth a shot. So he decides that that is what he's gonna do instead of hurling his body over the edge. He goes back into the apartment, gets a couple of his 
essential items, not all of his things. He doesn't want it to be so obvious. Dan quietly walks out of the building with no plans to ever return. Larry makes several attempts to contact him. He does not answer any of Larry's calls or texts, and he answers his phone for no one else that is associated with Larry. When the spring semester of their senior year begins, he gets himself on campus housing and busies himself with two jobs on top of his classes to keep his mind off of this fresh trauma. Once the students of the Ray family spot him on campus and they're noticing like he keeps his head down, doesn't make eye contact, wants nothing to do with them, Larry begins contacting him again but Dan sticks to his guns and he does not answer. And you know what's really odd about this dynamic with Dan and Larry is the fact that Larry participated in sexual acts with Dan and other people. It was as if he cultivated a space for him to feel comfortable engaging in all of the things that go with, you know, that lifestyle. But then you turn around and humiliate him, throw it in his face and make it like it's such a bad thing. Like, it's just, I don't know. That was really weird for me. But I guess, child, I ain't an occult girl. So I guess I wouldn't really get the rules. But let's just keep going because we still have a lot to go over. And mama's mouth is dry, okay? Dan had actually hoped that this showed his friends that were still a part of the Ray family that it was that easy to walk out. That they could, too, just leave and never come back and be okay. But unfortunately, none of them follow his lead and things just, child, they just become worse. Larry tells the group that Dan gave up on the path to greatness, that he could not take the pressure, baby, so he got out of the kitchen. He just did not have what it took to be a great individual. And so, yeah, he broke and he was out. But the thought that, wow, Dan really escaped crosses Santos's mind and for a second he wishes that it was him that had made the decision to walk out he wished that he too could do the same thing but he cannot walk out and leave his sisters there with Larry Larry no longer has Dan to beat up on so he really hones in on Santos and makes him his main target he accuses him of doing all kinds of things puts him in these sleeper holds until he passes out and then when Santos would wake up Larry would ask him if the darkness had enveloped him like such a jerk he had pulled weapons on him and threatened him and even if he did want to leave like his older sister Felicia is there is, is Larry's lover and his secretary okay and his baby sister is also there and he does not feel comfortable leaving them behind so each time that he contemplates leaving the Ray family, they are what ultimately makes him decide to stay. There are times that Yalissa wants to walk out as well, but at no point are all three of them on the same page. Graduation day comes and Santos does not graduate, but the rest of the group does. And the Ray family students get to see the other students at graduation. They all, for the most part, participate in the festivities for celebrating their graduation one of which being like this boat ride raven approaches claudia talia and isabella who are all you know sticking together having themselves a good old time to the left she asks if they're okay and then she tries to explain to them that what they are in is a cult and she is very concerned about their well-being like to Raven, from the beginning, the whole thing has been weird. And she's always wondered, like, what, what is it that Larry is getting out of this? What does he want from this group of kids? Because there has to be something. She begs them to separate from Larry before something tragic happens. And each of them, they just brush it off as if, you know, she's talking nonsense. There's nothing to worry about and nothing is going to happen. After graduation, Claudia enters a program and she's also working part time. She no longer lives on campus, so she is splitting her time between her parents' apartment and Larry's apartment. But her being in the household with her parents and dealing with this whole Larry thing, like she still was so convinced that all of these things had happened in her past, how her parents were such terrible parents, and this puts a lot of strain onto their marriage. Ultimately, the two of them divorce. They move out of the apartment and Claudia does not want to, from my understanding, live with Larry full time. So she goes from living in the apartment with them to living in hotels. 
However, she is still very much under Larry's spell. And by this time, he is up all night, honey. He starts his day popping 120 milligrams of Adderall, and he is not sleeping. He doesn't need to sleep. Meanwhile, everybody else is sleep deprived and in a state of mild delirium. Now Yulitza, the youngest Rosario sibling, she is noticing that her sister's mental state is deteriorating rapidly. Her sister, who was always so smart and level-headed, highly educated, was on track to becoming a doctor. Med school complete. Now Rose temper tantrums like a child and needs someone to watch her at all times to make sure she doesn't harm herself. But just as her brother feels, Yulissa also feels hopeless and helpless, like there's really nothing that she can do and that she needs to stay here to keep an eye on Felicia. Now Larry begins forming these rashes, welts, and marks, and bruises on his skin. And instead of him rationally saying, oh, let me go to the doctor and see what might be wrong, he holds a house meeting and says that someone in the group Someone within the Ray family is working against him and making him sick. Now, it wouldn't be Isabella. She's proven her devotion to him, and she has been his ride or die since day one. It wouldn't be Felicia because she's a doctor. And doctors, they don't hurt people. They heal them. Child, quiet as his kip. Just hold it. Never mind. It wouldn't be his daughter, Talia, because it's his daughter. She obviously loves him and wouldn't do such a thing. Claudia is not there enough. He doesn't believe it to be her, and he simply just doesn't believe that it's Santos. So he narrows it down just to Yelitsa. In actuality, it's her turn to be zeroed in on and bullied. By now, he has the students believing that anything that they don't remember doing is not because they didn't actually do it, but because their memories are suppressed. But he knows that they did it. And even though they might not recall doing it, they still have to atone for their infractions. And he tells her, Elitza, that he is sick because she has been poisoning him with household chemicals. And he wants to know why and what she plans to do to right her wrongs. She apologizes to him, tells him that she doesn't remember it, but she will do what she can to make it right. She throws out all of the household chemicals and begs for forgiveness, hoping that this would be enough. But of course it's not because it's Larry and Larry is sick in the head. He turns on the camera and he begins recording a confession session with her, now accusing her of also poisoning her sister and says to her, this is the reason why she's on the mental decline. You've been poisoning her for months with these household chemicals. And although it's been going on the entire time that she's been there, it didn't start there. It started two whole years before she even made her first visit. Alicia is there listening to it all. She is reacting as if she's so hurt and she's so shocked to hear this revelation because Yelitsa is not denying any of this. Like she believes that she did this and she just doesn't remember. She's only elaborating on the lies that Larry is feeding her. Santos is there. He's horrified at what he's hearing. He believes it. Felicia, of course, believes it. Larry is pissed. He's like, you've been poisoning her all this time. You're such a horrible human being. Looking at the mental state where her sister is, compared to where she once was and believing that she's at fault for this, that she's been doing this malicious mess behind her sister's back and is the cause of all of this. It's just all too much. She doesn't think that this is something that she can come back from. Like, how do you redeem yourself from doing something this terrible? And so she doesn't. This confession session actually backfires on Larry and turns out to be a great thing for Yulitza because she felt like, there was no redeeming herself. There was no paying and atoning for such a horrible thing. And so in the middle of the night, she slips on her shoes, walks out of the apartment and leaves because she doesn't feel like she could make up for it. She gets on a train and goes to her shelter with no plans to ever return to Larry's apartment. By 2015, we are now five years into this and the group has reached new levels of dysfunction. Felicia, according to Santos, is no longer a functioning human being. She just sits on the couch, rocking and grunting most of the day. Sometimes she throws these temper tantrums where she's just like screaming and sometimes she'll become violent or she'll hit herself and 
Larry will have to step in and subdue her because he's the only voice that she listens to and responds to. In a strange effort to help keep her quiet, like in the absence of Larry Santos, tells her that he'll slap himself every time she makes a noise. And if she loves him, she'll keep quiet. But that don't really work. And when he is all banged up, he goes in on her telling her that she is supposed to protect him. She's supposed to be his older sister taking care of him. And she is obviously doing a poor job because now look at him. Like he's her responsibility and she is the reason why he is all banged up. Crazy stuff. Finally, Santos reaches a point where he feels like he can't take it anymore. Seeing Felicia the way she is, Larry now being physically abusive and him physically abusing himself at this point, it's just too much. He is at his breaking point. He physically just cannot endure any more of it. And so with just the clothes on his back, he walks out of the apartment while Larry is gone with no intention of returning. Now, once he gets a few blocks down from the apartment, his phone rings and it's Felicia. He tells her that he is not coming back to the apartment and she is not happy to hear that. She becomes hysterical. She's begging him to come back and telling him, Larry's gonna be so mad at me. He's gonna be so mad that I'll let you leave. Like, please come back. And finally, his sisters are not reason enough for him to remain in that situation. He tells her, I'm not coming back. You can leave, but I'm not coming back. He has not graduated. Like his life has completely gone downhill since he met Larry. And at this point, he just wants to go try to rebuild it. He goes to a shelter and he gets himself a job and starts the process of reintegrating back into society after all these years under Larry's thumb. Three years later in 2018, a website named after Claudia goes live and it has a lot of disturbing content. There's a video of her confessing to not only poisoning Larry, but also the eight original roommates in the student housing and other students on campus. Now, initially all of those friends and some of the alumni, they freak out because they're like, girl, you were, you were putting what in our water, girl? You were putting what in our food? But then they realized like none of us got sick, nobody died, so this is probably just a hoax. And it very soon blows over. Everybody pretty much just brushes it off except for Raven who is still concerned about these friends of hers. Especially Claudia, whose demeanor in this video is very alarming. Like she is not at all reminiscent of the Claudia that she had known. And she goes on this personal mission to physically locate Claudia. She does have some help from the other three students who are in the student housing. And she knows it won't be as simple as messaging Claudia and being like, hey girl, like she's tried that before. Even when she notices that there is a phone number listed on the Claudia site, Colin just does not feel like it's going to get the results. So instead, she tries to find an address linked to that phone number. But instead, her Google search turns up a Twitter account. And the Twitter account has... A link in the bio that goes to an escort page. Now this escort page has all of these sexy photos of Claudia as well as a price list for different services that can be um, ordered and for different lengths of time. She is a very pricey girl baby. She was not at all cheap. Initially Raven and the other three students they think about setting up a date for the escort and then like pulling off an intervention. Like it's not really, it's not really a John there ready to hand you some money, girl. It's surprise your friends like, girl, you need help, let's give it to you. Come with us. But then they feel like, well, if she's not been receptive to any help any other time, why would this be any different? So instead of that plan, they go to the authorities and they specifically seek out people who specialize in S trafficking. They tell them the story from the moment they met Larry all the way up to this escort page and the authorities basically brush this whole thing off. Like they're not really concerned about this. They feel like she's not being held against her will. There's nothing really to see here. So at this point they get in touch with a journalist friend of theirs to ask for his help. And he begins looking into Larry's background. He is very quickly able to dispel a lot of the stories that he had told them. He was not a Marine as he had said, and it wasn't looking like Miss Thing was in the CIA either. When their friend Ezra, 
the journalist contacts him directly, surprisingly, Larry is willing to sit down and talk with him. He also says, yes, Claudia is an escort, but her own free will. And basically, baby, that is her business. She had actually decided that this was something that she wanted to do to generate some revenue and she liked the kind of money that she was making. She had no problem making it for the household and no problem giving it all to him. Once Larry is interviewed and the entire timeline is laid out, an article is published with the purpose of bringing awareness to this situation and helping to free these students from Larry. One of the people that is actually moved by this article is Claudia herself. Something about reading on the paper really put it into perspective for her and kind of opened her eyes a bit. And the very moment that she entertains the thought of leaving Larry and this whole life behind, she does not sit on it. She acts and doesn't give herself a second to second guess anything. She too finally has her walkout moment. And not long after she cuts off communication with Larry, he is evicted from Lee Chen's apartment. Lee has finally had enough of Larry being cooped up in his little apartment with these students and all of their belongings. Lee had also become very disturbed by Larry's actions and treatment of the students, not to mention the number that they had done on that apartment after being there for all those years. He takes Larry to court to have him evicted. Lee also sues Larry for the damages of the apartment. And Larry responds by countersuing Lee, listing Talia, Alicia, and Isabella as co-plaintiffs, testifying as witnesses, giving these very bizarre and elaborate testimonies that Larry has saved their lives and he's this great guy that has been tied to their families for multiple generations. And it was just weird, just very bizarre, very left field. Okay, Alicia tells the courts that she and her sister had been sent to actually harm Larry and she had been poisoning him all this time. For years, she had been putting fecal matter in the bandages he used to dress his wounds, fungicide in his food. At some point, she had begun to actually care about him and feel bad. So she stopped. And it's basically just been up from there. Now, Lee actually wins the suit and Larry and the Ray family are told to vacate the premises, but it still takes another year for him to physically get them out of the apartment. Larry, Felicia, and Isabella move into his friend's home in New Jersey. But with this article gaining as much traction as it is, and now with footage of what had been going on inside of that apartment amongst the Ray family. Now surfacing here and there, the FBI's antennas go up and they get involved. They begin interviewing the ex-members of the Ray family and are a little disturbed by what they were hearing. Definitely felt like it was worthy of further investigation, which takes them a little bit of time to conduct. But finally, in February of 2020, the DA announces federal charges against Larry. They also hold a press conference where they release some of the details that they have, and they let it be known that he has essentially created a cult out of his daughter's college friends. And with all of the charges that he is up against, he is facing life in prison. January 29th of 2020, the FBI raids the home that they are staying at and arrest Larry. The only people that are present in the home with him at the time are Isabella and Felicia. For six hours, they interview both women separately about their dealings with Larry and what it's like living with him. Both women are definitely in a deep state of delusion. They deny having endured or witnessing any type of abuse whatsoever. And they refuse to speak an ill word against Larry. They say that they are not victims of his, they are his wives, and they are actually victims of their families, victims of the ex-cult members and these men in power, not Larry. He is their support system. Once Larry is hauled off to jail, both girls' families attempt to reach out to them and the girls ignore their families. They even go there to attempt to speak to them in person, hopefully bring them home, but the girls refuse to answer the doors. The parents leave notes for them. They do not write them back. They do not attempt to contact them. A couple of months later, Larry's friend who owns the home basically tells them like, look, y'all gotta go, okay? 
they first tried to move together but Alicia is now receiving counsel from a lawyer and this lawyer advised her that it is not a good look for them to continue to live together they need to separate and live in different housing situations okay especially considering the fact that the prosecution is threatening to bring charges against Isabella as well. They tell her, yes, she is also a victim of his, but she's also been a willing participant in some of the abuse inflicted on the others. And they have enough evidence to bring charges against her as well. Extortion, trafficking, money laundering, racketeering, all of those things, they could pin on her with no problem. And she would be facing a mandatory minimum of 15 years in prison on the trafficking charge alone. They also tell her that she could potentially avoid all of this and keep her freedom intact if she cooperates with them and testifies against Larry. They don't have to charge her with all of this, okay? And they'd be less inclined to do so if she works with them instead of against them. And Isabella does not want to. Now she herself gets a lawyer and a lawyer tries to have her declare mentally incompetent to stand trial. He's pushing the idea that she is brainwashed. And that is the only reason that she believes Larry is innocent. That her whole mental state is just growing. It's not even reliable right now. She needs help, not charges is what our lawyer is saying. Don't listen to what she's saying. But she is like, oh no, no, I'm well aware of what I'm saying. Don't listen to my lawyer. I know what I'm saying and Larry is innocent. She's also saying that she is, she is all there, baby. She is not incompetent. She is actually offended by her lawyer's approach. And ultimately the courts agree with her. You are well enough to stand trial, so let's go. And at that point, her lawyer quits. He withdraws his legal counsel and says that they just don't have a mutual understanding. They do not agree on her legal strategy, so he's out. Now, after Felicia's been by herself for some time and she's been talking to a lawyer, like some of the mental fog begins to clear. Not all of it some of it. One of the things that becomes apparent to her after her extensive interview with the FBI is the fact that she has false memories and that she does not know the difference between what has really happened and what has not happened in her life. And she does this interview where she's explaining this and she says, but for the most part, she feels confident that she does know the difference between what's real and what's not. Then the interviewer asks her if she knows Bernard Carrick. And if she remembers meeting him and she says, yes, as a child, he was friends with my family. And he's like, girl, no, he was not. OK, no, he wasn't. The interviewer then shows her a photo of herself as a young girl in a dress and asks her about her memories about the photo. And she begins telling a story about this picture of herself. And then she stops herself and says, oh, no, wait, that's Larry Brain. And the interviewer is like, well, how do you know those aren't your real memories? Like what really happened this day? And she was like, because I was recalling it not as a child or not as myself remembering as a child, but I was recalling it in Larry's voice, like him telling her the story behind the picture as opposed to her actually telling the story from memory. Like sometimes she is able to tell the difference between her false memories and real memories like that, but there are still a lot of memories or things things that she thinks are memories and she's not quite sure if they're implanted or if they really happened. During his trial, some of the students testify and more truth as to what was going on in the Ray family is revealed. Apparently, Claudia had begun to escort once Larry had accused her of owing him this huge sum of money and she felt like it was the quickest way to pay off her debt. So she begins to escort and she is raking in all of this money like mama is making a coin, okay? Larry had no way expected her to be able to pay him off. Like these are college kids, just as Santos was scrambling to get 47K out of nowhere. He didn't expect her to pay off her debt, but over time she actually does. So once she pays him off, she feels like that's it. Like she's done, she's paid her debt, but she's still gonna escort because it's a lot of money for her. And Larry is not happy with her decision to continue working, but keeping all of her money. So he had threatened her and blackmailed her to keep working for him. And for a while, she had started back working for him, but then decided like, look, I don't want to give you my money anymore. That is the point in which the website that was named after her had gone live because he had been 
threatening to blackmail her with all of her confession tapes and just a bunch of footage that would make her look bad. He had Isabella and Felicia keeping track of all of her appointments with her dates, how much money she was paid. And according to their log, in one year alone, she had brought in $700,000. She would at first work out of the apartment, but she kept working once she left the apartment and went to live with her parents. And then when she was living out of hotels, she was still escorting. According to Claudia, Isabella was kind of like his, I told y'all she was his lover and his secretary, okay? She was the bookkeeper. She would go to the hotel and pick up the money from Claudia. Claudia says that there were times where she would come in and beat her. One time she had tied her to a chair and put a plastic bag over her head and threatened to end her life right then and there. There were times where she was threatened to be waterboarded. Just all kinds of torture and abuse. And Isabella claims that none of that happened. But girl, how do you know? Because at this point, he's been playing musical chairs with y'all's memories. All three of the Rosario siblings also testify against Larry at his trial and they do him no favors, okay? Persecutors also refer to Talia Ray as her father's co-conspirator, but no charges are ever brought against her. And she has chosen very wisely to stay away from the media. Now, Ray's defense tells the court that any sentencing exceeding 15 years will not be necessary. I'm gonna try to, if ever I'm in court facing some some time, I'm gonna try to throw that out there. Like, girl, look, anything over a weekend won't even be necessary. Why not, you know? They also claim that Larry has been a victim of himself, having grown up with a very abusive grandmother, allegedly, that would whip him with a cat of nine tails and have forced him to sleep in the basement on a pile of blankets in that his grandfather would come in at night and essay him. And his grandmother was well aware, but she never did anything about it. Now the prosecution fires back and says that is all BS. And they describe him as an evil genius who engaged in these twisted therapy sessions, convincing these impressionable students with past trauma that they were broken and he could fix them and that he was nothing more than a sadist that was tormenting his victims for years on end. In court, they even shed light on a previous assessment that was done on him five years before he had gotten to Sarah Lawrence College. He had received a psych eval as part of the custody trial with his ex-wife, and the findings were interesting and very alarming. The doctor that had conducted the eval stated that it is impossible to evaluate Mr. Ray in the usual clinic manner. Quote, his personality dynamics are so configured that he is able to manipulate and control almost any situation in which he finds himself, including a psychological interview with a forensic examiner. No matter how experienced that examiner may be, Mr. Ray is very good at what he does. Do you know how crazy you gotta be? How twisted you gotta be in the mind for those to be the notes? In your psyche bow. Now, Claudia, she submitted a victim impact statement. She was not able to come to court and read it herself. A friend of hers came to court to read it. And it details all of the horrible ways in which Larry has impacted her life. How he was on a very deliberate and educated and sophisticated campaign to literally break her while he pretended to love and enlighten her. That is sick. As each of the students provide their victim impact statements, Larry sits in court and looks at them very attentively, like he is soaking in every single word, but he shows no sign of emotion whatsoever. On April 6th of 2022, 12 long years after meeting his daughter's group of college friends, he is found guilty on all 15 counts brought against him. In January of this year, 2023, 63-year-old Larry V. Ray is sentenced to 60 years in prison without the possibility of parole. He'll be a tender 123 when they remove the shackles off his feet so he can dance. Months later, Isabella pleads guilty to money laundering and publicly speaks out against Larry for the very first time. Mama took that deal and decided to squeal, okay? She said, why do Tim what I can tell on a friend, baby? I'm not going to jail. They for real about these charges. I didn't know. In a letter to the court, she writes, 
that she now recognizes that Larry not only hurt her, but used her to hurt other people. And she says to the victims and their families, she is deeply sorry. For her involvement in her little charge, she receives four and a half years of federal prison time. She definitely waited too late to um, accept the deal. It's better than 15 years, I guess. The Rosario siblings, they reunite and begin rebuilding not only their relationships with each other, but their relationship with their parents because job they had just drilled that into the mud. But luckily for them, their parents forgive them for everything. Claudia had reunited with her friends and family the moment she left Larry and is hopefully doing well today. She has completely declined any comments about this whole ordeal and I can't even blame her. Girl, go live your life in peace. Dan published a memoir about his experience with Larry and is seemingly doing well. And Isabella, according to her mother, still has not accepted any attempts that she has made to rekindle their relationship. She is just doing her time, girl. Making her macaroni pictures, whatever the girls do in jail, okay? Probably writing little letters to Larry. Who knows? This was a lot. I'm glad nobody died, but it was a lot going on. Can y'all believe Larry tried to die? During his trial, like, look at him. He had a stroke. Maybe they sent him right on back to the land of the living. They said, no, ma'am, go back there and face those charges. Y'all, my baby's birthday. Y'all know Bella is a little cancer, baby. Her birthday was July 14th. And just like last year, we threw a party, like I said, like six hours ago in the beginning of this video. She has so much fun. Come here, girl. Come here, girl. I invited her little doggy friends that she sees often and they just had a blast. We had some food, we had some drinks, some music and a great time. Bella <laughs> was a little skeptical of the water. Y'all know those kids that keep up the most drama, like them little, I don't want to say bad, but they're kids. They're always so afraid of like something that they shouldn't be afraid of. That's Bella. Now she was a little skeptical at first and I had to pick her up and hold her in the water. But as long as I was holding her and she was on me on my float, she was perfectly fine. Yeah. Hey, it's your birthday. Bella is... Y'all know Blue is Blue Phelps, okay? He gonna swim, backstroke, all of the things. We were throwing his ball in, he was going to get it. Blue is a rock star in the pool. He loves the water. Even Poppy, he enjoyed himself. Poppy tried to drink the pool though. He tried to drink the pool all up. We had water for them, but something about that chlorine on his tongue, he just lacked. So after about 13 shots of pool water, he throws up, gets sick, girl, and they have to just drag him out the party. Poppy was like the one that came, had too much to drink of pool water though, and then got sick and then had to just be hauled out of the club. At that point, Bella was tired, Blue was tired. I was like, look, I wanna still have my fun, baby. I rented this pool for a couple more hours. Okay, I'm gonna get my money's worth. So I sent my kids home with my sister. Amen, she was ready and willing to take them home because she was tired too. Y'all know how the kids party always turns into a grown up party. So I had a time after they left as well. And Bella is so funny at the end of her party, like she was getting her gifts presented to her. And she is so funny, like they really are like kids. I don't know how she got the understanding that she was leaving with my sister, but it's like she knew. Everybody was like, come on, Bella, you know, come get your, come get your gifts, come get, look what I got you. And she was just like standing at the very edge of the gate. Like, mm -mm, baby, I can't miss my ride. I can't come back over there with y'all. My friend even got her this jumbo can of whipped cream. She was giving whip shots out to the dogs. Bella did not even come get her whipped cream, okay? She said, I don't care what y'all doing. I'm not doing it with you, I'm going. Home. So my sister took her own home. She is so funny. She was so tired at the end of her party, but she had a blast. She got to ride around in my sister's Jeep with the top off. And Bella loves the car ride. So that was just like the cherry on top of her day. And then one of the gifts that my sister got her was this like body spray for dogs that has sparkles in it. First of all, it smells amazing. When Bella had a bath, I sprayed that on her and She's a Frenchie, so she's used to having to do like extra care things like getting wiped and 
having her creams put on ears clean like little extra stuff so she's always down for her little her little care so i put her body spray on her and i feel like she was feeling herself she turned her little head and i saw one of the sparkles reflect some light i thought it was the funniest thing ever because bella looked like oh yes baby i'm that girl and i was like i don't know how i feel about my daughter having a body spray but i guess she she would be like 14 now so i guess it's okay bella got her first little body spray from her auntie and it is adorable and then when I sprayed her, Blue had just had a bath and I felt like he was looking at me like he wanted to smell like that, like he wanted to smell good. But I sprayed him one time and y'all, he ran off so fast. That obviously was not what he was thinking at all. And then he came back running through my, my living room like a maniac and tried to wipe his back on my couch and on my rug to get the scent off. See, that's why he should have minded his business in the first place. Now he got a little, little patch of sparkle on his back and little piece of them that just smells so good while we on the subject of dogs right before i get out of here because mama's like girl <laughs> it's giving desert like i really have to i haven't even eaten anything but a little bit of watermelon today and it's 4 26 p.m yeah i gotta get out of here but anyway i had poppy over last night just chilling you know my little nephew or whatever giving my sister a break poppy loves the minions movies like anything minions he absolutely goes crazy for he loves it so i put on the minions he was watching it laying down, minding his business. But Poppy hates horses. Like, it's a trigger for him. He doesn't care if it's a real life horse. He does not care if it is a cartoon horse. He doesn't care if it's a horse that goes nay. He does not like it, okay? I turned this little Minions movie off, honey. I paused it and I put on a horse movie and he went bonkers. Went crazy at the TV. <laughs> Just nuts. Like, are y'all's dogs this crazy or is something in the water in our house? I don't know. Let me know down below. Also, let me know your thoughts on this case. I cannot wait to talk about this with y'all. Share this video with a friend. Like the video before you leave. Please subscribe if you have not. As always, I genuinely appreciate you so much for spending your time with me. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just not ciao take two what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just what do i say they're very vindictive and because of him they have been sick no because of him they Ugh. we got too much to talk about like please go easy on me and because he is in this predicament, predicament girl, that big booty Judy, Rudy Giuliani. A lot of his or, I was about to say a lot of his oris, girl. What? Now, for the most part, there. Come on, Brittany. Come on, pull it together, baby. We can't be sitting here filming all day. I think I got my lashes on the wrong eye, but I'm kind of feeling it. Let's go. Why are you chittering? in my peripheral vision. Claudia's mother is adamant like Bella. Bella is right on the floor, chewing something and sliding around on the floor, baby, just making more noise. <sighs> Why are you licking my elbow, kid? That's why. Now, that's it, Bella. I'm putting my foot down. Leave me alone. Hi, pig. You want to fight? Because you know I'm always down, baby. You can't threaten me with a good time. I two-piece you, baby. Hey, you eat a biscuit for free. See, I'm trying to let you sit up here. You want to sniff the night, the mic. You want to sniff the coffee off my breath. Got the people thinking my breath stink, girl, because you just won't leave it alone. She just gonna, she just gonna squeak that like that in the background, like that. I knew this was gonna take a while to film. I did not know it was gonna be this chaotic.
unsatisfied with Dan's versions of events. I'm unsatisfied with they little versions of events. These are the versions of events I'm unsatisfied with. Girl, give me a break. They were immigrant parents from the Dominican Republic. It started with a D. Was it the Dominican Republic? Yikes. And then she subsequently, oh. And they have enough evidence. Ugh. In January of 2023, this year. Okay. Bella. You me? It's your birthday. Bella is.